This is Unsung History, the podcast where we discuss people and events in American history that haven't always received a lot of attention. I'm your host, Kelly Therese Pollack. I'll start each episode with a brief introduction to the topic and then talk to someone who knows a lot more than I do. Be sure to subscribe to Unsung History on your favorite podcasting app so you never miss an episode. And please, Tell your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, maybe even strangers to listen to. In 1777, Marie Antoinette, then the Queen of France, lost a bet to her brother-in-law, the Comte d'Artois, younger brother to King Louis XVI. The bet was over how quickly the Comte or rather, the 800 workers he employed, could construct his new country house, Chateau de Bagatelle, apparently named as such because the massive estate was to him a mere trifle. At the housewarming party for Chateau de Bagatelle, the guests played a new game, or at least one that was new to them. In this game, the players used sticks to shoot balls up an inclined playfield, past pins, with the goal being to get the balls into holes. The game, reportedly a hit with Marie Antoinette, became known as Bagatelle, after the name of the chateau. There's no record of what King Louis XVI, whose favorite pastimes included locksmithing and woodworking, thought of the game. Nearly a century later, in 1871, Montague Redgrave was granted U.S. Patent Number 115357 for Improvement in Bagatelle Game. Redgrave's version was a compact wooden cabinet with the cue stick replaced by a spring mechanism that propelled the balls onto a fabric playfield. Nails stood in place of pins, but the goal remained the same, to get the balls into the holes. By the 1930s, the new Bagatelle games were becoming very popular. In autumn of 1931, David Gottlieb, who'd founded the arcade game company D. Gottlieb & Company in Chicago a few years earlier, developed a wildly popular coin-operated game he called Baffle Ball, a 24-inch by 16-inch pin game that sold for $17.50, with the metal stand available for an additional $2.50. According to the Internet Pinball Database, Baffle Ball was, quote, the first game to top the 50000 mark in production and deliveries, unquote. Baffle Ball's success inspired Chicagoan Roy Maloney to create a similar coin-op game, Ballyhoo. At 1650 for the 31-inch by 16-inch game, and with the addition of eye-popping, colorful art, Ballyhoo was an instant success. And within five years, the Bally Manufacturing Company employed 500 people and sold dozens of games. These machines were exciting and popular, but they were still a far cry from what we think of as pinball tables today. And they weren't even called pinball. The term pinball itself was apparently first used in 1936 although it's unclear who coined it. Early pinball machines were small and light, and some players used that to their advantage. Physically positioning the machine by lifting it or bumping it to control where the ball rolled. Game designer Harry Williams, who would later found his own pinball company, Williams Manufacturing, devised an ingenious solution to this manhandling of the machines. In 1934, Williams placed a ball on a small post 
inside a machine that would fall off if the machine was jostled too much. He originally called this the stool pigeon, but he eventually renamed it the tilt mechanism. And he redesigned it to be a pendulum inside a metal ring, which allowed the player to apply some motion, but not too much. Perhaps the single most important innovation in pinball development came about in a 1947 Gottlieb game called Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty included the first ever flippers, developed by game designer Harry Mabs. The six flippers on the machine, three on each side, were powered by solenoids, devices with coiled wire that convert electrical energy into mechanical motion. Future designers, including Steve Kordak and Wayne Nayans, adjusted the placement and orientation of the flippers, creating the now familiar two flippers at the bottom of the playfield, guarding the ball drain. By the time flippers were introduced to pinball, however, the game had been outlawed in many parts of the United States. In Fiorella LaGuardia's second stint in the U.S. Congress, He had tried to introduce legislation to ban games of chance, including pinball. But the bill never went anywhere, something LaGuardia blamed on the manufacturers. But when he was elected mayor of New York City, he saw his chance to finally clean up the city, if not the country. In late 1941, Citing a need to use materials for war production rather than amusement, LaGuardia asked the city council to outlaw pinball. In January 1942, he got his wish, when Magistrate Ambrose Haddock ruled that pinball was gambling and thus illegal. LaGuardia immediately sent police out on a raid to confiscate and destroy tens of thousands of pinball machines. It wasn't just in New York, though. Cities such as Los Angeles, Milwaukee, New Orleans, and even Chicago, home of pinball manufacturing, followed suit and banned pinball. It wasn't until 1976 that the ban on pinball was finally lifted in New York City, after writer Roger Sharp testified to the city council that pinball was a game of skill, not luck, and then proved his point in a demonstration, playing the pinball machine bank shot in front of the council and even calling his shot a la Babe Ruth. Most other cities relented as well, and pinball machines were popular staples of arcades in the 1980s and 90s. By the end of the 90s, though, home video game consoles had driven a decline in pinball popularity. And at the end of 1999, only one pinball manufacturer was left standing. Stern Pinball, run by Gary Stern in the Chicago suburb of Elk Grove Village, was the only major manufacturer of pinball machines for over a decade. But in 2011, a new company came on the scene, Jersey Jack Pinball Company, and others quickly followed. By 2017, NBC News was reporting on the unlikely resurgence of pinball. As of this recording, the crowdsourced pinball map shows 40,137 pinball machines available to play in 9,882 locations. Joining me in this episode is illustrator and cartoonist John Chad author of Pinball, A Graphic History of the Silver Ball. 
I'm also joined in this episode by a very special guest co-host, my 12-year-old son, Teddy. Hi, John. Thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. I'm so excited to get to talk about history and pinball with y'all. Yes, and to be on the first episode with my guest co-host. I'm so honored and so pumped that you're with us here today, Teddy. Also honored, I guess, because I read a lot of your science comics books. Oh, gosh. I'm, I'm, I'm honored. <laughs> okay, so how did you become interested in pinball? Like, what got you into pinball? I think that the the clearest through line, because there's, there's several times when I was growing up, because uh, I used to go to arcades a lot as a kid growing up in the 90s. There was a mall near where I went to uh, school, and sometimes I would go there after school and I would I would play video games. And there was pinball machines there. But I think that what what directly got me into pinball was I was living in this very small town in Vermont called White River Junction, and it had a very small population, uh, one pizza place, you know, one block worth of stores and everything, and a pool hall opened up with a Star Wars Episode One pinball machine in it. And me and my friend, Alec Longstreth, who's also a tremendous cartoonist, we both love Star Wars. And so suddenly in this town with not a lot of things to do, there was a pinball machine <laughs> about <laughs> Star Wars. And we just hammered that thing. We had so much fun. And that was really our gateway to like kind of this bigger world of, of pinball and pinball design and aesthetics and and everything that now I really love about pinball was just through playing this one game. I think you talk about manufacturers having this idea that like, oh, if we put intellectual property, that'll like bring people in. And so it mm -hmm. worked. <laughs> 100% worked on me. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, this is uh, further, further along in the book, that machine, Star Wars Episode One, is sometimes credited as being the, the downfall of a lot of pinball. And so I feel, obviously, I feel bad about that, but I loved it. I thought it was a great game. I don't think it deserves all the flack that it gets. But yeah, I saw just like the Star Wars logo type from like across the room. And I was like, you know, Terminator eyes, you know. Di -di 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 -di. Yeah. I want to hear a little bit about the process of writing a book like this. Like, you know, how do you do the research on the history piece? Put that with writing, put that with illustrating. Like, it seems like a lot of things to sort of pull together. There, there was a lot of, uh, yeah, there was a lot of juggling. And in some ways, there's a lot of synthesis from one art form to another, right? I'm trying to take this very specific art form, the language and, you know, art of pinball and kind of communicate it through the art of comics. And where I do think there's some overlap in those languages, there's a lot of not overlap. Mm -hmm. And so I think the, fir the first thing that I did was I made a number of pages of, of comics as kind of like a test to see, can I talk about pinball using the comics form in a way that's interesting and novel and, and doesn't diminish one form or the other? Because you can't see if you're listening, obviously you're listening to a podcast, but I have a whole shelf of books back here all about pinball. Like there's no lack of pinball books. But so if I was to do a book about pinball, I needed to contribute something else. And I saw that something else is the integration of the comics form. Once I kind of did those test pages and realized, okay, I think I can utilize the language of comics in a way to, to talk about pinball, I then started to go research. I got all these books. I watched all the documentaries, all the movies. And I also had a bunch of interviews lined up. I was lucky enough to talk to Roger Sharp. I talked to his son, Josh Sharp. I talked to Nick Baldridge out in Virginia, who's like one of, in my opinion, the foremost experts on like electromechanical machines. And I was able to kind of like fill in the gaps with my research, with asking them questions. I was really big into color coding when I was researching this book. Uh, when I would go through and make my Google Docs of my notes, I would make sure to color code everything to uh, whatever source I got it from. And that ended up being like really, really useful because as I was like, as stuff was hitting the cutting room floor, I was able to kind of still keep track of where everything was. And if I needed to go back and, oh, I can't, I don't have five pages to devote to, you know, the introduction of the pop bumper. I only have a couple panels where, where was the best facts about the pop bumper? And I'd return to those works. So there's a lot of color coding, a lot of uh, note taking. And then 
you know, just kind of pushing that through my normal comics making process of thumbnailing, penciling, and inking. Well, I think this might be the single most important question in this episode. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> okay. What is your favorite pinball table? Oh, my gosh. Oh, I think my favorite machine, gosh, it, it might be like Metallica, the, the Stern Metallica from, I, I want to say, like tw- the early 2010s. I just, I really like it. I really like the, the Dirty Donnie art on it i am not like a tremendously skilled pinball player (laughs) and so there's something i mean you can get real real deep into the rule sets on some of these machines but this one just really speaks to me so i've always i've always liked that and i've had a lot of really memorable really fun games on it so that's the one that comes to mind just sitting here but i i definitely fluctuate you know i'll go to an arcade we have we have a lot of great stuff out here in the bay area and i'll I always walk away just being like, oh, well, no. you know, Swords of Fury is my new favorite machine. <laughs> <laughs> right now, my answer will be Metallic. So I want to go back through the history a little bit and, you know, maybe not all the way back into, you know, 18th century France or whatever. But let's talk some about the connection between pinball and the American Depression, which, you know, I I find this, it's such a fascinating time in American history. Anyway, you've got the Depression, you've got Prohibition, there's so many interesting pieces of cultural warfare going on (laughs) at the time. So I wonder if you could talk about that in relationship to pinball. Like, what is it about pinball? I don't think we're even calling it pinball yet at that point, but like, that is so fascinating to people in that time period and then draws the ire of people like Mary LaGuardia. I really think it comes down to escapism. You know, I think the same things that a, a young person might say about a video game today, I think that they were saying about pinball back then. Wow, look at these, look at this art. This is a really technological experience. This is so cutting edge. I mean, you have to remember that like some of these machines, 33, 34, 35, you're starting to get electronic components like lights or uh, very simple kicking arms. Those are the building blocks of some of the most cutting edge in- inventions of the time. Like the doorbell had just come out. And here's a machine that has electronic motor technology like a doorbell. And then to us, that sounds like rink a dink, <laughs> but that must have been mind blowing. And this was for like a comparably really small amount, this idea that you could escape your your everyday troubles and for a real paltry sum interface with this kind of fresh novelty, uh, I, I think was just very intoxicating. And also, you know, think of the 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 state of media. You know, movies are you you've got movies and you've got film reels and everything, but you know, you don't have animation quite yet. You don't have you don't have any sort of color projection and here you could have these full color tables you know eventually with these big back glasses that have these tremendously imaginative transportative scenes on it i can imagine somebody you know having a very hard time in the middle of new york city being swept away for only a penny to a tropical backdrop of some sort of exciting game that's kicking the ball around and lighting up and ringing bells and everything I, I, I think that's what it boils down to, you know, putting our, ourselves in the shoes of somebody who has never seen a Nintendo in their life, you know, never seen a TV or a smartphone and what it must have felt like to see like the Bagatelle game Chicago kick that ball all over the place as if by magic. Well, there are going to be a lot of questions about your opinions, <laughs> but let me just start yeah. off with designers. You can mm-hmm. do any era. Who do you think is like either your favorite or, in your opinion, the greatest designer of all time? Ooh, I, I think that I, I feel like a lot of pinheads that are listening to this are leaning forward in their seat right now. <laughs> <laughs> I have a tremendous affinity for uh, Pat Lawler. He he has designed some of my favorite games. He's still in in the pinball game designing games. You know, he did Dialed In very recently. He did. Roller Coaster Tycoon, which I really, really love. I just think that he has a good sense of like play and a good balance between speed and stop and go. Those are, those are kind of like the two predominant design philosophies for pinball. 
you'll see these games by people like Steve Ritchie who are like uh, flow games. You know, his intention is that you're shooting one shot, it's flowing directly back to the flipper and you're shooting again, shooting again, shooting again, versus other people who design games with a little bit more patience. You know, you're stopping the ball, you're aiming, you're shooting. And I think Pat Lawler, for me, hits like a good balance between those two. Um, and I just have a lot of fond memories of this game. So that's that's who I would pick. But there's a lot of great ones out there. Again, for people who are maybe listening to this and like, oh, an episode about pinball? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I would check out the Steve Steve Ritchie games. The uh, George Gomez games are really tremendous. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of great designers out there to check out. This will be like the... The the pinball is bouncing between the history and the... <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> so you were talking about the, the ways that during the Depression, it was so interesting. And I can imagine that, you know, it, that being escapist, as you described mm. it. But there are people who adamantly hate pinball, <laughs> who think pinball yeah. is like ruining the country, ruining the youth. Do you think this is something that's just sort of wrapped up in this time period? I mean, there's people trying to prohibit alcohol. There's people trying to prohibit, you know, singing and yeah, everything, all sorts of things. You know, is there something in particular about pinball and especially pinball the way it was then that's different? Or is this just, you know, basically the kind of thing we see now and, you know, somebody's trying to ban something just to get people riled up? Like what what's going on? I I, I mean, I think part of the American condition is is looking for a scapegoat at times mm-hmm. um in media in emerging media right like we see it with video games we see it with different online things where you know there's no nuance to some people's approaches and, and judgments of them you know they they perceive it to be bad and they kind of construe the worst case scenarios can i sit here and say that one of one of the ar- classic arguments was like oh children are going to spend their lunch money they're 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 their precious, precious lunch money, you know, playing these pinball games. Can I look at you and say that that never happened? No, it it probably happened at some point. Was it widespread spread enough to cause like a national emergency? Absolutely not. I think it just really comes down to, yeah, blaming something for a problem that ultimately can't defend itself in the same way that like, you know, let's, let's take like the Mortal Kombat example for instance you know when when mortal Kombat came out there was a lot of ink spilt about the damage that that was doing to american youth were there games that glorified violence that had blood yes you know there there is a little bit of truth behind this stereotyping and and scapegoating and the same is true with pinball you know there were some games that would in like the thirties, they would pay out some like a token or gum or, you know, some knickknack. And there are documented instances of unscrupulous people offering to trade those trinkets for more valuable things, thus getting people in the, in the door to put more money in the machine with the hopes that they could trade it in for, I don't know, watch or a cash or something. Do you also have instances of, you know, unscrupulous people or criminals using pinball machines as a way of like laundering money. I I'm sure you do. I I'm sure you do. But again, this is not to the volume that would warrant such an overreaching reaction yeah. from, from politicians and law enforcement. I don't think that there's anything inherent in it that made it like ripe to be targeted, save for its newness. And popularity. I was shocked mm-hmm. when you yeah. said how many machines were destroyed in New York City. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. When all was said and done, it's like over eleven thousand. It's it's an un to, by today's standards of of machine population, it's an unfathomable number. I can't imagine eleven thousand machines in New York today. Uh, it's just it's wild how many were out there. According to the book, eleven thousand eight hundred, nearly twelve thousand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's 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 crazy. I I wonder whether like anybody will ever a lot of them were dumped into the Hudson River. Mayor LaGuardia, who was kind of the architect of pinball's uh, downfall in in America for for an extended period of time. He he made love to make a great show of smashing these machines and 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 toppling them over and you know turning the legs of the machines into billy clubs for law enforcement. And, you know, he would boast that they were being dumped in the, the river by the barge full. 
Um, because they were made of wood, I assume that they're all disintegrated. But I don't I don't know. I mean, like if like old shipwrecks can still be maybe there's just like a pile of <laughs> machines at the bottom of the Hudson. Mm, if you're a, a salvager out there, <laughs> this seems like <laughs> the project to go do. <laughs> I would love that. I would I would buy I would buy something that was made from reclaimed pinball wood <laughs> from the bottom of the Hudson. That'd be that'd be so killer. This is gonna sound kind of similar to your pre- to my previous question, but hmm. if you could have any pinball table in your apartment, what would it be? And do in you have op- one? <laughs> I I don't. I used to have. I've had a couple of machines, uh, but at one point I moved to an apartment that was just too too small, and I. I, I didn't have the social capital to be like, hello, I'm going to bring my pinball machine with me. Uh, so I sold the pinball machine. But I used to have a Jurassic Park and a Gottlieb Arena. And at different points in my life, I, I had those in my apartment. And it was it was quite small. Uh, a game that I would have now, I would want something that's like easy to maintain. I would probably want... I'd probably want something classic from the '90s that I could just get just get a lot of fun out of, but that doesn't have like super super complicated electronics. Yeah, so something from like the Data East era, just because I have a lot of experience with those machines. Maybe like Star Trek: The Next Generation, because I think my wife would enjoy that as well. Ooh, or 2001: Lord of the Rings. Oh, that'd be a good. I think that's the one. That's the because <laughs> we would both get it. We'd both love that. We both love Lord. And so my husband Teddy's dad. I'm pretty sure he would get the TNG one if I ever allowed him to have the social capital to have a pinball machine in our small condo. <laughs> he would definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That's his, I think he, he loves, he plays them online and I think he likes playing that one a lot. Mm. I would, I'm surprised that there hasn't been some sort of move to make like smaller machines. Like it seems short sighted in my opinion that, that there's nobody's been innovating like oh what if we just made like a smaller machine maybe even move back to that tabletop bagatelle era mm-hmm. you know for for this kind of generation of a, a lot of people living in condos and apartments you kind of are excluding a large portion of the market that just don't have the space and don't have the ability to like have a, a pinball machine in their uh, efficiency <laughs> So uh, I want to talk a little bit about this. uh, I think it's 1976 when New York City says, "Okay, maybe we can stop. They've been banning for decades pinball and finally is like, all right, maybe we can allow it. And Roger Sharp, who you mentioned earlier that you had a chance to interview, is like, "Okay, it's my chance. I'm going to go fight for pinball. Can you talk a little bit? This is such an interesting moment in history, really. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and what you learned about it talking to Roger Sharp. Sure. I think one of the, one of the one of the greatest things that I, I learned from talking to him, besides that he's a tremendously friendly guy, he's so nice, is that it was not necessarily a like ex, uh, external forces, you know, descending upon New York City looking to like you know undo this ban. In some ways, the, the call was coming from inside the house. LA had already re-legalized pinball machines and New York as a, a entity could kind of see across the, the expanse of the United States and be like, oh, wow, they're making a lot of money because now the operators are having to pay these fees mm-hmm. to, to have the pinball machines, even though they're legal. They just have to pay for a gaming license. And so there was a desire within New York City's political scene to, to kind of get in on that money. You know, it's like, oh, if we realize that we could get that money. So that was an interesting because, yeah, initially I thought the the kind of two sides of the of this was, you know, like Roger and the, um, you know, electronic amusement organization. I forget the right, the exact acronym, but they like, you know, they're the forces of good in New York. Like, <laughs> but in some ways, there was aspects of New York that did want this to go through. So so he you know, Roger is a writer. He's not associated with the um, amusement organization that was kind of pushing through this re-legalization. He was just a big proponent of pinball. And he had written this amazing book called Pinball. So it was clear that he had the ability to speak on the subject with seriousness and uh, maturity. 
you know, in a way that I think would be absolutely necessary in a conversation about a game. Mm-hmm. And and a game that people could argue in the room is a game for children. And he basically, you know, hoisted this conversation, this argument that, you know, pinball is a game of, of skill. It's not a game of chance. It's not this slot machine. It's not this gambling device that we have no effect on. You know, it's as much of a game as golf or baseball. And, you know, the finale of this hearing was for him to show, like, the, to, to back up his argument by showing what he could do. And the other, you know, really interesting thing that I learned from Roger was that they had this uh, El Dorado machine that they were going to play on. And he he was familiar with El Dorado. He, he had played it before and, and kind of knew the rules and, and knew what to do. And at the last minute, the, the the head of this committee that they were speaking in front of kind of was like, no, 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 not that machine, not that machine. You know, like you have probably done something to that machine. Like it's been sitting out here all day. You know, who knows what you've done to it? We'll use, you know, drawbacks, curtain, the backup machine. <laughs> and it's this uh, copy of Bank Shot, which he'd never played. And I actually didn't know that. I didn't know that he had never played Bank Shot. Uh, which just makes the story even more incredible because then he proceeds to just like unleash the most killer game of pinball on just cold, right? He's just reading the table, reading the rule card and just figuring out what to do and narrating like everything that he's doing as he's playing. And it just creates this just complete takedown of any argument that could be leveled about this being a glorified slot machine. So you were talking about making pinball machines smaller. Yeah. You mentioned additive manufacturing in your book. I think that could be a very viable solution to that. I think so too. I think the the only downside to and, and you're referring to like 3D printing, right? I've actually never heard that term, and I really uh, it makes total sense. Additive <laughs> we have a 3D printer here. <laughs> oh, I'm very jealous. Uh, we have one at the local library, and uh, if if it can be printed in under 40 minutes, it's free. So I've printed a lot of little knickknacks. I think I, I, it just it comes down to force. These pinballs being thrown by the solenoids generate a lot of force. Uh, the first time I visited the Stern factory, the one of the biggest pinball manufacturers still around, they had a couple of test machines set up that were just running the ball being flipped by a flipper to hit a piece of plastic or a button or a toy just to see if it could hold up to the to the force of like ten thousand hits, you know, over and over and over again. And I'm not convinced that additive printing, at least in my experience, has the strength to be able to withhold that that force. Now, that being said, the solution to that might be just like a lesser powered solenoid. I don't necessarily have like enough knowledge in in this field (laughs) to to say what would make it possible, but I certainly think it could be possible. Um, I can tell you that there are like carbon fiber nylon filaments out there so i think it could be possible mm. oh sure yeah 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 yeah. if there was a if there was a more heavy duty material that could take the blow i think that that certainly would would help i, I think that a lot of the reason why pinball machines have like remained the same size is probably because of you know the the necessity to have bulk orders you know, like, oh, the, the cabinets, we order like 10,000 cabinets. And there's this one company in Chicago that makes all the cabinets. And that's the size they are. And to to get 10,000 of a different size cabinet would be like an astronomical. price. I, I assume that that plays into it. But but additive additive manufacturing certainly eliminates some of those like minimum order necessities. Yeah. Especially with like a print farm with like thousands of printers. This is, this is Teddy's dream is that we like buy a house just to make a print farm. It's not going to happen. <laughs> I've never I've never heard that term, Teddy, and I love it. I absolutely love it. Do those things exist? Yes. In fact, like the companies that make printers have print farms so they can make the components for the printers. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I just got like a like a, a real like machines making machines like apocalypse vision in my brain but then i remembered it was 3d printers and i was like oh okay no it's fine (laughs) as long as we don't attach ai to it we're good (laughs) yeah sure sure (laughs) then i've i've got a problem for you (laughs) all right that that'll be a different podcast um sure so i wanted to ask your your book is kind of a 
political social history, but also a technological history, but also in some ways art history. And so I think that the art is the piece that is really interesting to me because I think it's people don't necessarily think about pinball as being art unless they're real pinball aficionados. So I wonder if you could talk about the art and what it, how that is a, a genre of art on its own, as you mentioned earlier. I think I saw on your website that you've actually done art for a pinball table. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and, you know, that that piece of the history of pinball that people might not think mm. much about. Yeah, I I think that when you when you when you strip away all of the the art that we're about to talk about all the narrative all the all the kind of bigger communicative ideas what, what you're left with is a, a piece of plywood with a ball rolling up and down like that's all that's all it is like you have two flippers at the bottom you're you're throwing that ball back up the plywood and eventually it's going to come back down and you know the fact that pinball you know takes that experience and kind of turns it into something else is a is a really special experience um and i think a lot of people if they don't if they can't get that then pinball will never be anything more than just a piece of plywood with a ball on it for them in the same way that you know some people just can't get their teeth into animation the poor fools you know or someone just doesn't really love comics or doesn't really get a certain genre of music i i think some people just it won't click with but you know pinball art and 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 its communicative ability is really at the intersection of a lot of different arts. And that's not unique to pinball. Well, there's a lot of multidisciplinary things out there, different products, different art forms. Um, but pinball combines animation, lighting, programming, graphic design, industrial design, cabinetry into one experience. Uh, I think people you know, pinball art, you know, just those two words, they would naturally start thinking of the, you know, the cabinet, the big, the big box mm -hmm. that is the pinball. I realize I'm throwing out this pinball jargon. The cabinet's like the main body of the game. The back box is that part that sticks up at the, out of the top. And I think people would think of, you know, the, the, the back box, the cabinet, the play field, like that as being pinball art. But for me, pinball art is really at that intersection. It's when that ball is rolling and you are timing a shot so that it hits up a ramp and at the right moment, a sound is triggered of a dragon breathing fire. And at the right moment, a light is flashing on a dragon that is breathing fire. And you as a player, as that ball is heading back down the ramp towards you, have this feeling that you just attacked a dragon. And that's really special. That's, that's, that's cool. <laughs> um, and I think once you can kind of get into that, like, oh, this is not just a ball hitting plastic, rolling up ramps. Mm -hmm. Like this, this ball is a, a part of a, of a narrative that's unfolding that I am in control of. I think that's the magic of, of pinball art. You know, graphically, it comes in very different styles. You have realistic styles. You have these beautiful games from the 60s that are more like abstract or, or cubist. But at the end of the day, like when I say pinball art, I'm talking about its communicative ability, its ability to, to, to take all these things, these disparate arts and rewrite what you are doing with your hands and flipping the ball and turning it into like a, a story, a moment in time. And it's, it's so interesting how precarious that art is, is balanced. I was playing the new version of Jurassic Park a month ago. And this particular uh, instance of the game, there was a switch that was broken on the main ramp. and. It, it, the whole the whole the whole illusion fell apart. I was trying to play this game and I couldn't advance. The 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 lights and the sounds weren't syncing up correctly. I was doing things to the game that weren't giving me any feedback. That relationship between me and the game was broken. I, it just was so. And later I was thinking about it. It was so fascinating that like just one like small like electronic component breaking kind of smashed that illusion for me. Yeah, it's it's really. Uh, I'm trying to think. I think the most classic example and the and the one that people point to as being, they they point to it as being the ur -er of uh, pinball storytelling is high speed. This game themed around speeding cars and escaping from the police. You know, so you have 
all of the sensory inputs that one might have being in a car in that same experience. You've got the speed of the ball. You've got the unpredictable, you know, swerving path as if you're trying to like evade, you know, the cop car. You've got the light changes from green to red as the lights are changing around. You've got the flashing, you know, sirens. You can start seeing all these kind of things that on their own wouldn't mean much come together to to give you the sensation. Oh, I feel like I'm being chased by the cops. <laughs> Whoa, how quaint. And so that's something that evolves over time then, that that storytelling piece. You know, I mean, I make the argument in the book that even as far back as like the 40s, you, you know, when pinball machines started to replicate, even, even through the Bagatelle era of the 30s, I would even argue that like there's a level of narrative and transportation in making a game about a tropical location or, you know, the, the, there's games about, you know, the Chicago train system that are some of my favorite Bagatelle machines. And like, if you're not in Chicago, that's probably got to be transportative. And it's not a comp- it's not a complicated story. And it's not a story that necessarily facilitates the same relationship or interaction. But I think it certainly tells a story. I think it's once you get to like sound and like complicated light shows that you really start to like put the pieces together on like mm-hmm. telling a complex story with more nuance than just you're playing a hand of poker. Select the right cards, I guess. You know, that, I mean, that that's a story, not a very exciting story, but it is a story. Yeah. Yeah. So the technology and the storytelling feed into each other. Yeah. Yeah. You had asked about, you know, my experience designing a machine mm-hmm. or doing the art for a machine. And I think what I would say to that is I, I, I'm tempted to, to, to say specifically I did the graphic art for the game or the illustrative art, because again, I think of pin, when I think of pinball art, I think of this communicative ability that's dependent on all of these things. And I didn't mm-hmm. do all those things. Mm-hmm. When, when I zoomed out after I was done with this game and I actually played it, I realized that inch for inch, my art was all over the game, but it was only one aspect of this larger experience. And I could use the art to try to communicate things on my end. I did the, it was the Jetsons for Spooky Pinball. And like one of my favorite moments on the art is one of the ramps. I lined up the ramp with an illustration of those vacuum tubes that the Jetsons take. Uh And I wanted to give the player the feeling that the ball going up the ramp, this plastic clear ramp, was similar to that vacuum tube. And I, I, I really think I nailed that. I'm really happy with that. That's like my, my like favorite little moment of communication in the machine. Same thing, like right by the dog Astro. Astro's running on a treadmill and the treadmill was right next to a spinner, which is a device where you hit it with the ball and it spins around and hits the switch multiple times. And that idea of rotation, I thought that that, that paired well with the idea of like a, a, a treadmill. So those, those are the sort of things I tried to keep in mind um, because I, I realized quite quickly that like I was working in my little cubicle in a much bigger figurative office uh-huh. that would make the game it, it, its fully realized kind of art form or piece of art. Well, since we're nearing the end of some people's attention spans, <laughs> I think we should ask you where listeners of this podcast can get the book or like learn more about your other work absolutely you can get my book pretty much uh, you can order it through any local bookstore that you prefer it's on the regular online vendors that you find Um, it's called pinball a graphic history of the silver ball you can find more about me and my work uh, at johnchad.com and that's john chad with with no h Uh, no h and john h and chad (laughs) (laughs) and then i'll also put a plug in for the if you're interested in learning pinball and getting into pinball two great resources i would put out there is the pinball map which used to be an app but now it's a full-fledged website Uh, i still think there's an app version but you can basically plug in whatever city you're in in most of america um, and then some other like larger european cities and you can be like oh what games are available and it will boop, boop, boop. It'll tell you which places are there, which games. Uh, and some will even say like what condition they're in. I would also plug the Professional Amateur Pinball Association, PAPA. Uh, at papa.org, they still have a great library of tutorial videos. 
uh, of pinball machines. I have found that kind of reading about how to play pinball is far less effective for me than watching somebody play pinball. You know, I could, I could sit here and start rattling off, oh, you know, you hit the, the center shot five times and then the gate dropped, blah, 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 blah. But like kind of seeing it in action is, is really cool. So that's what I would, two places if you're looking to, to, to dip your toes in. Can you please also plug your amazing science comics because uh, the, the kids in this house and the adults do really love them? I'd be happy to. I have done a number of science comics, uh, comics where I take scientific subjects and try to relay nonfiction facts in a fiction setting. I'm firmly of the belief that nonfiction should be fun <laughs> and that we can still walk away from a good story having learned something. Uh, I've done one about volcanoes. I did one about the periodic table, and I illustrated one that was written by Rosemary Moscow about the solar system. Later this month, two books that I've done about mathematics are coming out, taking the same approach of combining kind of fiction and nonfiction. Excellent. Was there anything else you wanted to talk about? Have you two gotten out and played pinball? When was the last time you two have played pinball? <laughs> I don't know if I've like ever really had the chance to play a pinball machine. Uh, I That's, think I think you did. Like maybe once. Yeah. It's not because there's any dearth of pinball machines in Chicago. We do live in like the pinball capital of the world. Oh, you're in, oh you're, you're in Chicago? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I'll send you a list. <laughs> <laughs> but Teddy has played uh, online games. Like digital pinball? Yeah. Yeah, like pinball arcade, pinball FX. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Those are great. L listen, you're not going to... I'm I'm not a purist here. Pinball is pinball. I think that there's things that you can do in digital pinball that you can't do in regular pinball or, or IRL pinball. And that's like to be celebrated. When you asked me what machine I wanted, I came like this close to saying like a virtual pinball table, because then I could have like a lot of machines. And then also I wouldn't have the same uh, uh, mechanical upkeep of like fixing solenoids and switches and stuff like that, which I'm happy to do. But with a with a young kid, it's it's something you know, time is a, a rare commodity. <laughs> Are you saying there are pinball tables and just like the whole play glass is just digital? Yeah. Yeah, it's just a just one giant screen, and then it has like a you know a glorified Raspberry Pi in there, and then you load up different digital games onto it. Uh, it would be a very play. different experience from like playing on a controller on a PS5 or something. It would absolutely, yeah. The idea I have a hard time playing. I I played a game on my keyboard uh, recently, and I also played a play a game on my phone where I had my fingers on, mm. you know, each side of the screen. And it just, it's not the same as having the, the table. And some of these virtual, you know, systems are getting better with like being able to shake mm -hmm. and have some semblance of like, oh, it's shaking. I haven't played a virtual table in about a year and a half. And so I can't speak to like how good that the shaking is these days, but it's, it's there. There's so many interesting things happening in, in pinball right now. We're really living in the golden age. It, when I got into it around like 2010, it was still kind of in the doldrums. Jersey Jack had not yet reared its head. And that was like the next big publisher. It was like just stern for like an entire decade. And when I got into pinball, I was just at the tail end of that. And the documentaries at the time were just very dismal, just very sad about the outlook of pinball. And things have really swung up. And certainly some places have still shuttered their doors, but there's like a ton of pinball manufacturers, you know, people putting out one title a year, one title every two years. Uh, I'm particularly a fan of this company based out of Texas called Multimorphic, where they're creating this modular pinball system where the, the back third and the front third can be exchanged. Mm -hmm. And then the middle third of the game is a giant touch screen and the ball rolling over the touch screen interacts with different things gary stellenberg yeah gary stellenberg it's so cool yeah definitely check those there's got to be a multimorphic machine up in chicago well john thank you so much for joining us this was really fun uh not all parts of u.s history are fun but at least this was fun uh and i i really enjoyed it <laughs> uh yeah it was it was lovely to talk uh it, it's uh always great to talk about pinball history uh it always gets me fired up and makes me anxious to, to go out there and play again 
And I will admit, I am not much of a pinball player. I have played in my life, but maybe I'll go out. I think there's pinball machines probably right in our neighborhood, actually. So I, maybe I'll go out and <laughs> check out a pinball machine. <laughs> You know, I, I personally find that it's like car antennas, like when cars used to have antennas, yeah. the second that I would recognize like, oh, cars have antennas. I, that's all I could see every single car going by. Now that you're like aware of it, every time you go into a place, you'll be like, oh, wait, there's like three pinball machines back there. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to Unsung History. You can find the sources used for this episode at unsunghistorypodcast.com. To the best of our knowledge, all audio and images used by Unsung History are in the public domain or are used with permission. You can find us on Twitter or Instagram at unsung underscore underscore history or on Facebook at Unsung History Podcast. To contact us with questions or episode suggestions, please email kelly at unsunghistorypodcast.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate and review and tell your friends.